Our final presenter this morning before we break for morning tea is Cam Leung of Linus Corporation, a company and a sector we at Canaccord are particularly excited about. Cam joined Linus as General Manager WA in May 2012 to support Linus's exciting transformation and growth period as the company delivers on its Linus 2025 growth vision. In August 2020, Cam was appointed as VP upstream. In this role, Cam is responsible for all operations in WA, including Mount World Mining and processing operations, and all WA-based development work, including the Kagooli project. Cam has over 30 years experience in the resources sector. Since joining Linus, Cam has played an integral role in the ramp up of the Mount World Mine and Concentrator and the Linus Rare Earth Separation Plant in Kuantan, Malaysia. Please welcome Cam. Thanks, Toby. Um, real pleasure to be here today and just, um, just um, confirm what the others have said. Really thanks to the Diggers team to put this event on. Our CEO, Amanda Lacaz, was very, very disappointed she couldn't be here today, but she's told me she's definitely going to be here next, next year. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about Linus, but in particular, our exciting new project, because we're going to be building a new downstream rare earth processing facility here in Kalgoorlie. I'll just start off with the, the picture there. That's um, what we call NDPR oxalate, so that's neodymium praseodymium. It's a beautiful pink colour. It's been filled into a crucible just before it goes into one of our eight tunnel furnaces. And these tunnel furnaces we've got in our Malaysian plant, they're about 88 metres long. They're like a, a mega pizza oven. It takes about 12 hours to go through the tunnel furnace to cook it, and it runs at about 1,100 degrees in the hottest spots there. And the product, which we make at the other side, is no longer this beautiful colour. It's actually a dirty grey but that's our NDPR oxide. That's what goes into making rare earth magnets, which are used in things like um, automobiles, electric vehicles, um, wind turbines. So this is our disclaimer. And I've just got a photo here. Um, today, we're the world's second largest producer of separated rare earth material, and it all starts at our Mount Weld mine. So Mount Weld, we're high grade, we're long life, and we're recognised as one of the top rare earth deposits in the world. This photo is of um, just after the end of what we called Mining Campaign 3. Um, it's actually our fourth mining campaign. We actually finished this in February this year. Um, the pit is relatively small. It's about 650 metres um, up and down and about 350 metres wide and about 60 to 65 metres deep. Our sort of mineralisation starts at about 30 to 35 metres below the surface there. So our grades are so high that we don't actually mine full time. We, we mine, we sort of campaign mine. You can see all the stockpiles and then we basically blend from the stockpiles to feed our concentrator. So we're on it like a, a two to three year cycle. Um, a lot of the media outlets out there still show photos of our mine from 2008, so hopefully if they want a new photo, they're very, very welcome to have this one. And the original pit that they actually show is in the bottom um, right-hand corner there. So in terms of people talk about their life of mine, our strategy is to maintain a 25-plus year ore reserve. And we're actually, our deposit, we're actually in the high-grade oxidise and rich zone of what was a volcano. So if you can picture a volcanic pipe about three kilometres in diameter extending into the ground, we're just in this oxidise and rich zone near the surface. And we see a lot of potential to ex extend our reserve actually there. But um, we've actually drilled down beneath, beneath that and we've actually encountered the primary mineralisation We've only got a very limited amount of holes in there, but we see, and that's the primary mineralisation that is the, the source of what we're seeing up above. And um, we see a lot of potential there, and we'll be drilling both within the sort of oxidised and rich zone and also deeper um, this year. So a bit about Linus. So today, we're not only the world's second largest producer, of um, separated rare earth materials. We're also the only significant producer outside of China. So very, very important position. 
Um, our market capitalisation, um, I think as of last night, was just over $2.4 billion. We've got a small amount of debt from what is essentially the, the Japanese government. So our process starts, our mine and concentrator at Mount Weld, so it's about 300 kilometres northeast of here, just near Laverton. We produce a concentrate, which actually goes straight past Kalgoorlie, all the way down to the Fremantle port, and we export that through to our plant in Malaysia. So it's in the, on the east coast of Malaysia, basically directly across from um, KL, and we have what's the world's largest single rare earth um, processing plant in the world. Um, we're an integrated facility there in Malaysia. We're very, very different to um, a lot of the sort of um, businesses that we talk about here. We don't produce just one or two or three or four products. Um, this year, we actually made our 17th different product quality. So that makes my mind boggle. Um, we have supply customers in Japan, and we're the key supplier into Japan, and then also into Asia, into Europe, and also into America from there. And one of the things I'll talk a bit more about is we're committed to doing some more downstream processing, in particular what we call SEG oxide to actually produce some heavy rare earths, and we've been working on a project with the US Department of Defense in Texas. Um, last month, we just completed a very successful equity raising. We raised about 425 million. Um, Canaccord was um, one of our underwriters, and a lot of interest, and basically this actually allows us to um, fund our um, Kalgoorlie plant plus a range of some of our all other smaller projects. There was a lot of interest um, from both the um, placement institution offer, and we raised about 311 million from that, and then about 114 from the um, underwritten um, retail entitlement officer, office offer. So asked, why did we do it? We were progressing with, I suppose, an, an, a combination of um, debt and equity um, options, but at the end, we actually saw that a, an equity solution was the best thing for us. And basically, the, we're in a position now that we can sort of see out any of the economic uncertainties and just get on with our projects. And our, currently our share price is trading very well and we're about 40 cents higher than the issue price that we had recently. This is an aerial photo of our Linus Malaysia plant. As I mentioned, it's the largest single rare earth processing facility in the world. It's on a 100 hectare site. It's um, complex. We have at the far end, inside that red, red box, we actually have four 60 metre um, high temperature rotary kilns. In the centre section, we've got 900 solvent extraction stages. In the back end, on, on the right hand side there, we've got the eight tunnel furnaces that I mentioned. We've also got 46 plate and frame pressure filters on this site and about 47 seven high speed centrifuges. It's a complex plant. I took us quite a few years to actually ramp it up and I quite often actually sort of wonder actually how we actually got it to actually run and stitch it all together. So the area in red, that's cracking and leaching. That's what we call cracking and leaching. That's the first stage of processing that we do in Malaysia. And that's the process that we're going to be replicating in Kalgoorlie. Um, it was originally, I suppose, we were looking at expanding our cracking and leaching capacity as part of our growth strategy but with some changes in our, a new condition in our renewal of our licence in Malaysia, it basically has locked it in as both a replacement and also expansion capacity. So one question I get asked is, why Kalgoorlie? Yeah. And um, I've gone through here with some of our thinking there. So firstly, we were looking for a site somewhere between our mine site and the port of Fremantle, so somewhere along there. The day after we actually announced our Linus 2025 sort of strategy in May last year, um, Alex from the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder actually rang me up and he said, Kalgoorlie is a great place for your plant. 
we understand your needs. Uh, we want you to come here and we're willing to co-invest. So that was, <laughs> I wondered who he was, but that was a very, very positive thing, thing to actually hear. And we could understand that Kalgoorlie wanted the employment and wanted the business. But some of the things they could offer, land, especially water, um, it had the workforce, the infrastructure, and probably the understanding of what we actually do, understanding of things like the byproducts we actually produce from processing facilities like ourselves, and made it, I suppose, an obvious choice. And I'd certainly like to thank the city and the um, Kalgoorlie community for their support. Um, one of the things I mentioned was around options for our byproduct management. And certainly here in Kalgoorlie, we've, we've got a number of options. Our first preference and um, byproducts from plants like ours is certainly one thing that's sort of core to our business is that we'd actually like to be able to reuse the byproducts. We did a lot of work in our Malaysian plant actually on reuse options, but we certainly recognise that it's, gonna, it's a long-term um, journey to actually do that and it'll really only start after we start making the byproducts. We also recognise that for a, a long-term um, operation like ourselves, we're going to need a fair bit of um, space to store the byproducts and much more than on the operating site. And so we sought a, a range of sort of other options around the Kalgoorlie region and certainly like to recognise the support of the WA government, in particular the Mines Minister, in, in that um, search for a, an alternate site as well. Um, fourthly, Kalgoorlie, it's got the things that we need, infrastructure, access to chemicals, and the, although it's sort of somewhat remote, it's certainly well serviced by rail and road. Both the West Australian and the Australian governments have been very supportive when we said we wanted to build a plant in Kalgoorlie. And we're very, very pleased that we were awarded both lead agency status by the WA government and major project status from the Australian government. And both have been very, very supportive in actually navigating our way through the project. And I'd certainly like to thank both governments for their assistance. Um, one thing I get asked a lot, and certainly the message for us is we're going to be employing a residential workforce. And certainly see Kalgoorlie as a very, very livable city and a residential workforce is certainly something we wanted. And other things that we wanted for our type of operation, we needed a strong sort of MET sort of support. And that's certainly something that Kalgoorlie offers. And then also the sort of institutions such as the um, TAFE and the, Wasn and the Curtin University are sort of key sort of um, aspects for us. I wanted to um, talk about a bit about downstream processing and, and it's certainly something that's not straightforward. Um, I suppose there's always been almost universal um, strong desire, I think, within the both governments, um, the community um, in Australia for more downstream processing rather than just um, exporting um, or exporting concentrate overseas. But um, it doesn't proceed that often and quite often um, it's a very, very difficult journey. And we certainly believe that we need to actually understand these challenges and then work out, you know, how, what are we going to do to actually address them to be successful. And I've listed here, you know, some of what we see as some of those challenges. Um, the first one is many times when we're looking at downstream, it's something we haven't done before. And um, in comparison with the real depth of um, experience and capability we've got in our resources industry, when we look at downstream processing, quite often um, there's very, very sort of um, few or even basically hardly any at all, um, experience and capability. And when I'm talking about experience and capability, I'm not talking about just one or two sort of, um, let's say, metallurgical or processing experts. I'm just talking about the depth of experience you actually need to run a plant like ours. It's not fatal, but it certainly makes things challenging. Another one is the cost of capital projects in Australia is high. And it's not just by a little bit, it can be significantly more. And we would need to really think about what we're going to do when we build something in Australia. 
it's no good building something and then being a high cost operation. We're very, very driven by being in the right part of our cost curve. It's something that's been a core part of our business with our high grade mine, with our sort of um, large low cost plant in Malaysia. And there's cost of many inputs are actually are higher in Australia and things like labour are many, many times higher than they are overseas. Also, we've got the, the tyranny of distance, the cost of overland transport in Australia is very expensive. We've had very, very good um, government, political and government support for our downstream processing projects. In other countries, um, governments actually um, co-invest or they actually subsidise some of these critical projects. We were very pleased when the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder actually said they wanted to actually co-invest in this project. They wanted to provide us with water, they wanted to provide us with services to our gate, they wanted to upgrade the roads for us. So very, very thankful for that. And we would certainly welcome the same from, from the state and the federal governments. That's some of the challenges, so how did we approach it? Firstly, in terms of what we're doing, in this case, we actually know what we're doing. We've done our design based on what we've learnt in Malaysia, but also we've actually built in a number of um, improvements, and our, our design of our plant, or the high-level engineering we're actually doing in-house, so we're not going to pay someone else to train them how to actually do our process, we're going to do it ourselves. We also looked at what we were building in Malaysia. We've got four rotary kiln lines. Um, when we looked at that, and we're building something basically of the same nominal capacity, when we looked at the cost of that, we certainly recognised that that wasn't feasible. So we've gone for a single kiln line. We've tried to simplify our circuits as much as possible tried to get the economies of scale, which gives us advantages in both um, capital costs and also in operating costs. And certainly I think it's an approach that um, has shaved um, very, very significant amounts out of the sort of um, capital costs and then also out of the operating costs. Another one is when I started my career, and not quite as long as Peter, but um, almost as long, um, a lot of the companies actually had in-house engineering capability and then over the last 30 years we've actually seen a drift away from that to um, a lot of very, very capable sort of um, engineering houses. But in our case, we do what I probably call a, we're like the owner builder. So we're doing the design ourselves, um, we're going to actually do our procurement directly wherever possible. Um, we're going to have about 60 packages that we'll actually um, contract out. Um, other things, we use experts when possible. We're doing a lot of our engineering with our Malaysian team back in Malaysia. And in terms of who we use, our preference is to engage a lot of the mid-tier um, WA companies, companies which we see as we can deal directly with some of the senior people and then also companies that we believe um, offer very, very good value for money. Um, the support, as I mentioned, from the city, the WA government and the Australian government has been great. And then some of the final things, we're committed to local content, we're committed to local employment. We've tried to break up a number of our packages so the local businesses actually have a good chance of actually um, bidding for those. As I mentioned, will be a residential operation We've been in the gold fields for over a decade and we look forward to, be, to be becoming part of the Kalgoorlie community. So a bit about our project. This is one of those um, 3D sort of um, pictures of what we're going to build. So this design's based on what we're doing in Malaysia except it's going to be a, um, a single kiln line. So we're going to take the concentrate we produce at Mount Weld, we're going to feed it, um, we're actually going to mix it with concentrated sulfuric acid and then feed it into this rotary kiln. And that's going to actually convert what is a rare earth iron phosphate to a rare earth iron sulphate, which is actually water soluble, and then we literally put it in a tank, a stirred tank of water. The rare earths dissolve, some of the iron, some of the aluminium actually dissolve as well but then we actually raise the pH using um, magnesia, and then the iron, the phosphorus, 
the aluminium actually precipitate out and we end up with an iron phosphate, but we get a rarer solution. And in Malaysia, we would pump that to our solvent extraction plant. Here, we'll actually precipitate that out and produce a rare earth carbonate, so a solid. We'll filter that and then package that and send that to Malaysia to be dissolved and then feed our, our solvent extraction plant. So, in terms of where we're up to, we've got a, um, a sublease on a, on a bolt lock of industrial land from the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder. Last Friday, very, very pleased, we got our general purpose lease from the, the state government. We're well progressed on our approvals and um, had very, very good engagement with the, both the WA and the federal agencies. Um, JITSI's been great, the EPA has been particularly good, as well as the Mines Department. So we've cleared our Commonwealth approvals. Um, we submitted our referral under, for the, under the EPBC Act, and recently we actually got the ruling from the delegate of the minister saying that um, we're not a controlled action under the EPBC Act, and the outcome of that is basically we'll be regulated under the, uh, by the WA government only. And currently, we're going through our EPA um, referral process. In terms of um, all our high-level engineering's done, we recently announced that um, we've actually ordered our long lead time sort of critical path item, and that's the rotary kiln. So I mentioned this one's going to be replacing the four kilns we've got in Malaysia. This one, when I think about it, it's going to be big. It's going to be six metres in diameter. So if you can picture that, six metres high, and it's going to be 110 metres long. So it's going to come in sections and then be assembled and welded um, in place on, on site. So we expect that to start arriving about between July and October next year. Timing-wise, um, we're planning to undertake some preliminary works, maybe late this year or early next year, to actually get into our full construction in the second half of 2021, so next year, planning to start commissioning in the back half of 2022, and we want to be fully ramped up by the middle of 2023. And for our operations with both Mount World and the Kalgoorlie plant, once we're into operations, we expect we'll be employing about, directly employing about 200 people and with contractors providing a, a lot of other services. In terms of COVID, so we had the impact of COVID on our markets, on our operations in Malaysia and also in Australia, we went into COVID in pretty good shape. The Malaysian government, it might, su um, might surprise people, but uh, has actually been very, very proactive in managing COVID. We did have a shutdown in our Malaysian operations for 44 days under the government movement control order. But um, since then, we've actually um, restarted and we're currently operating at about 75% capacity. So we're running three out of our four kiln lines, three out of our four sort of major solvent extraction chains trains, and that's sufficient to currently meet the market demand, and our intention is we'll ramp up as the demand um, increases. So um, how has COVID affected the demand for rare earths? So the sectors that we sell into, we sell into a lot of the digital technologies, a lot of the um, clean energy sort of um, sectors, and the automotive, automotive sectors amongst um, others. Um, one thing that we've actually seen, so some of our products actually go into the wind turbines, so actually into the generators there, that's the rare earth magnets, and we've seen the demand from that sector hold up very, very strongly there. These are long lead time items, and as Peter talked about, I think it's certainly a, a trend that we're going th through in the world. The automotive sector is a very key one for us. Some of our products, the lanthanum goes into the catalysts for making of the fuels. The cerium actually goes into the catalytic converters to actually um, remove harmful sort of NOx and carbon monoxide. But our main product in terms of value is the neodymium, praseodymium, and then also some of the sort of um, dysprosium and terbium, which go into the rare earth magnets. So in your normal cars, we've actually got a lot of electric motors doing things from seats to windows to um, in the workings of the car. 
but in electric vehicles, they actually go into the drivetrain. And that's the big growth area for us. Um, in terms of automat automotive sales, been um, quite hard hit as COVID came on. And when we actually look at the sort of different forecasts, um, one of the latest forecasts actually estimates the likely decrease of about, um, in global automo um, automotive market of about 15% in 2020 compared with 2019. But one of the very, very um, um, interesting things that's actually come out in these forecasts is the sales of electric vehicles would actually remain flat. And that's probably pe think people like Peter buying electric vehicles there. And also suggesting a very, very strong sort of growth, the trend towards electric vehicles. Another trend that we're seeing is the increasing focus on resilient supply chains. Um, COVID has been very much a reminder that a, a singular supply chain um, can easily be disrupted. And we've seen announcements from a, a range of governments on critical raw materials um, supply. We see very strong support around the world for diversity in supply chains. And we see ourselves as established producer in a prime position to actually take advantage of this um, trend. One of the last things I want to talk about is um, heavy rare earths. Um, it's a small, but it's a critical market. Um, we actually have heavy rare earths actually in our ore body. When we actually look at our sort of ore zones, we had our original, what we call our central lanthanide deposit, basically in the, in the center of our deposit, and wrapped around it now is what we call the Duncan deposit, which, or Duncan sort of um, ore zone, which is named after one of our original geologists. And it is actually enriched in heavy rare earths. So we've been blending about 20 to 30% Duncan actually into our feed to our concentrator since the middle of last year. And we produce a product in Malaysia, it's about 5% of, by volume of products we, we, we are making, and it's called SEG oxide. So it stands for Samarium europium gandolinium and it contains a lot of the heavy rare earths. So up to now, we've been basically selling that mainly into China where someone else actually separates it. So we've got a project, it's always been on our agenda to actually do the separation ourselves. We have the capability, we have the feed, and we've been working on it um, with the partner in the US, Blue Line, who's been a long-term customer on a project with the US Department of Defense to actually do heavy rare earth separation. So if we did that, this will be a plant in Texas, and we would actually um, send, um, treat the SEG that we actually produce. So apart from the NDPR, the neodymium praseodymium, the SEG and the heavies, we make a range of cerium and lanthanum products, and that's been the main um, focus of our um, product development. So I mentioned we'd made our 17th product earlier this year. We see a lot of scope there, a lot of opportunity for improvements in both um, our market size, but also especially in the margin improvement with these um, specialty products. And that they'll go into existing and also new uses. And when I talk about increased margins, I'm not talking about five or 10 or 20%, I'm talking about two, three, four, five, or even more times sort of increase in um, price. And that basically forms the final leg of our Linus 2025 strategy. And just finish on a slide, I think Peter basically in the previous talk stressed the importance of sustainability and of having sustainable supply chains. And many of our um, end users or um, customer customers or probably end users actually, that sustainable supply chain for rare earths really matters. As a company, we've been ISO accredited since 2012, so basically since we started up, so that's 9,001, 14,001, and initially 18,001, but we're converting to 45,001. We actually get audited by some of our customers who actually come and actually audit our operations in terms of a sustainability audit. We have other organisations such as Ecovatus, who actually um, accredit basically um, supply chains, actually do audits on us. So for us, sustainability is um, a, 
it's actually a requirement, it's actually a core part of actually what we do. And thank you very much. I've Thanks. got uh, one question in two parts, Cam. Okay. Um, what differentiates Linus from other critical mineral companies and how can Australia capture more value from cr critical mineral processing? Um, well, compared with other sort of, um, sort of critical minerals um, sort of um, projects, um, we've got the high grade tier one long life ore body. We're currently doing it. We know what we do. We've got the operating assets. But very importantly, we've got the first mover advantage. We've got the, the market position um, with our things. And then in terms of what can we do, um, I see that we're in a very, very strong position to um, go step by step. And I think um, we actually need to think about you know, how far downstream that it's actually um, can be done in Australia. But I suppose doing things downstream with, I suppose, downstream um, industries is a core part of, I suppose, going further downstream. Great. Thank you, Cam. Just before we break for morning tea, we've got a couple of announcements from the organisers. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Um, Anybody who's leaving uh, on planes this afternoon, flights 1609, 1891-1858-1601-1065, you should get your bags and put them in the pods that are out the front near the, the uh, Caterpillar front end loader so that they can go out and uh, you can then nice and easily go out to the uh, strip and jump on your plane and everything will be good. Uh, secondly, I, I just want to give you a little bit of information about what is happening uh, after lunch, uh, just to make sure that everyone's got the message. People have said, why, why, why have you got a, an orange shirt on? Well, because we're going to have these hats on after lunch because we're going to be busy and we can't afford for anyone to be in there. It's absolutely essential that all, all of the uh, booths have everything taken out of them that you have. Uh, because uh, if, if it's still there, even on the booths on the outside, if, uh, if you've still got gear in there, uh, by tomorrow morning, they will be starting to pull down the enormous marquee and it's going to get in the road. So it's very, very important that you get your gear out. The rest of them, everything inside the red line is being completely demolished. And that starts at 12.40 and we cannot afford for anyone to be anywhere in the marquee. The marquee will be closed. There'll be no uh, screens in there to watch anything in the marquee. You'll, you'll need to do that in the small marquee or, or in this building. Uh, so please make sure you've got your gear out and we can move in and we don't want to go through the exercise of trying to educate people about how you, how you get out the door. It shouldn't be too hard for us. Uh, but it really, does, it really does stop us from doing any work if there's people still in there. So thanks very much.